with a spark. Uh, well, you know, like many of us very smart people, Daniel Engelbart was not the easiest person to work with, so we managed to steal all the best people to get into Zero Spark. And with Douglas Engelbart, uh, so what is actually, so he gave this famous demo, uh, in 19, maybe you should write the names? And so he gave this famous <coughs> demo in 1968, and he presented his system at a kind of conference of like, all the kind of key computer science and technology people. At the time, it was like maybe just a few thousand people, was, and uh, he demonstrated the system. So it didn't have, it didn't have, like, it didn't have paint, and it didn't have all kind of media simulations because he was a scientist and he was driven, as I said, one day by a different idea uh, to enhance communication and productivity among some <coughs> scientists and technical workers. But the system also had, for example, kind of hypertext, it had word processing, it had uh, teleconferencing, it had uh, network, it had uh, this kind of view control, right, the ability to uh, look at the same information in different ways. Uh, it, had, uh, like it had also the ability among of users to collaborate on the same document. So the case was a local network, but with people like in a room sitting around, and then all the computers were connected uh, through a local network, and it was 1965. So think about this capacity to collaborate on the same document by a number of users connected to the same network. Now, this capacity, right, was you know, kind of networks, local, local, local area networks, or for example, you know, Ethernet, right, Internet. It was already widely, you know, it first was used by scientists, you know, and let's say by, by the, in the 1970s, and in fact, financial industry was actually the first industry to adopt networking <laughs> in the 1970s, and then in the 1980s, you know, kind of networking becomes also common in small companies. But I would say it wasn't really until this decade when perhaps the larger public saw a real cultural potential with addition to print media. So, but, and of course, right, we know all about the consequences, but let's just say Marvel, by harvesting a small amount of labor and expertise, contributed by a large number of volunteers, social software projects, most, public, most right, famous in Wikipedia, create vast and dynamically updated pool of knowledge which would not be possible to create in traditional ways. So here's an example of how this, let's say, additions to traditional media over time have not only become their own media, but in fact completely changed how culture can function. Uh, and uh, what I want to do now is actually treat you to a nice, uh, nice, nice video treat, which is a short video where Alan Kay, it's a lecture which Alan Kay gave in Computer Museum, I think in the 90s. And he is going to show us a kind of video of uh, a kind of demo of Ivan Sarland's sketchpad, which uh, you know, was the most important influence on him. And in fact, this Ivan Sarland PhD thesis, it was like this kind of Bible among more radical computer scientists of the 1960s. And uh, this is, in fact, the whole, if you're interested, the whole, uh, the whole thesis is available online. Here it is, Sketchpad and then machine graphical communication system, and we'll see how I'll take and point out some very important new features of this graphical communication video. But even by the title when it tells you that this is not Photoshop. It's a and again sorry for the kind of sorry for the kind of gender, it's a human machine graphical communication system. It's a two-way communication system between human and computer which uses graphics. It's a very different idea when putting something in Photoshop, right? So let's look now at the video. So yeah, you can find this online, so just put Aaron Sutherland on Sketchpad and you find this. Okay. So, oops, sorry, there's some problems. <coughs> what we'll see here. Okay, let me make this larger. So it's not very big. Okay, no, it should connect to sound. Yes, I'm sure Finally, the sound. <laughs> on, the, on the day, you know, the day three, we got the lens with sound on. Okay, so even yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. oh, now. Okay, now we have to go now. Can you hit play? So we know if there's sound. This is the earliest known movie of Sketchpad. This was done in the summer of 62. Okay, I can make it bigger, but it's already low res, so I kind of feel it's. 
Now notice uh, he did something that we all. Okay, so this is 62. Alan Sarwood was 22. Took him about a year and a half to develop it, and his program kind of changed, right? The future, <laughs> the future of human civilization. So, so what did he do with it? Are familiar with, but now he's pointing to all these edges and he's telling Sketchpad to make them all mutually perpendicular. Sketchpad figures out how to do it. And the reason is that Sketchpad is not just one of the first graphics systems, but it was the first non procedural programming system. That might be disputed, but let me go on with it. Here again, he's making a couple lines. He's saying, uh, make them parallel and perpendicular, and Sketchpad straightens them up. Okay, so this is one of many examples, right, one of many features of Sketchpad, which really radically separates it from existing holographical media, right? So here, Evan Summerland uses the fact that, you know, the program, you, know, the, you can program a computer to solve problems, and here's this intelligent communication, right, where you tell the Sketchpad to, to change it way, and it does. And today, of course, we have this feature in some CAD programs, but Illustrator, Photoshop, for example, don't even do it yet, right? Why not? Now he's using a constraint called collinearity, and the little dashes are uh, aligning themselves right over the guidelines there. Okay, and now he's telling the guidelines to be invisible, and he's made his hole through the flange. You notice that Sketchpad is the first system to have a window, as far as I know. In fact, it drew on a very large virtual uh, canvas. Yeah, so actually the Sketchpad, oh, this is another little example of the properties. Sketchpad allows for magnification up to 4,000 times. So you can zoom it down, you know, which is also humanly kind of possible, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea of a kind of virtual window, and you can zoom it out 4,000 times, really, right? which was a lot. Now he wants to make a rivet, and once again, he only has to indicate the general topology and the rules that will constrain the topology into being what he wants. That's going to be the center of an arc. And now notice this clever thing, that if he makes these mutually perpendicular, that will force the, uh, well, you see what I mean. There it is, and now if he distorts it, it will still obey that general geometry. Now, he could have constrained the ratios of the sides just as well and kept the, the, uh, the rivet a specific shape. In this case, what he's done is constrained the angle relationships and center relationships, so we always get a symmetric rivet. Now, Sketchpad is also, I believe, the first true object-oriented programming system because what we see here is actually a dynamic instance of that master drawing that was just done. He called them masters. Now, nowadays we call them classes because of simula. So you notice you can take that instance and twirl it around and make it different sizes. And he's going to uh, stick it into the, the uh, hole of the, in the flange here. And one of the re reasons we can tell how early this is is because uh, in this whole film there's no illustration of visible constraints. And that uh, came, was the second phase of the implementation of Sketchpad. Here's a few more. I might ask, why is the screen blinking? Okay, I, just want to, I think you, maybe he's going to say it, but so <coughs> the, the innovation here is that uh, well, we have this kind of program, pro, program, programming language which has a particular capabilities and you project these capabilities onto a kind of screen, graphical screen. What we have is this idea of inheritance of properties, right? So I can make a glass, and then I can make, let's say, a cup of this glass, and for example, the second copy I can change its color, but for example, if I change some property in the glass, it, this, this change will propagate itself to all the copies, right? So again, this is another, another kind of new capacity which was never before available. Well, the TX2 here is putting up every dot by brute force. So he's gone back to the master and he says, well, I really don't want to see those uh, guidelines. I'll make them invisible. And notice all of the instances feeling.